So usually um, that was Smuggler and Me 2016, but we actually started wearing masks 2012, and I uh, would uh, have to start presentations explaining why we're wearing masks, and I would give for usually these reasons, you know. Uh, because we are uh, privacy extremists and we, we are, um, care about our privacy and uh, we actually thought in 2012 that we can fly under the radar with masks when we go to conferences and I didn't really understand media and uh, that led to a lot of interviews and even a movie and yeah we wanted to start a movement and then um, this year we, uh, we cooked up some bad soup and the thing went viral and now everybody wears a mask. So, um, and that's actually how memes work, you know? So everybody knows this, but um, it doesn't necessarily have to do much with reality. Um, and last year, I tried to do a meme, and I thought, okay, in 2020, the cyberpunk age will start, and I had, you know, all these ideas um, how it's gonna how it's gonna be in 2020, and it turned out to be totally different than what I expected. But it's still pretty cyberpunkish. And um, and during that time, I had um, some time where I was basically, you know, waking up every day and reading all the news and uh, getting all the information and following, you know, how it's going up and going in China and all of this. And I also had times where basically uh, I got sick and um, I didn't really know what I was having and I didn't really know I was sick, but I was sick and uh, I consumed no news at all and no social media, nothing. And I had these two uh, different experiences and, um, and I could see how it really had an impact on my, my mental state. And that kind of got me thinking on mimetic warfare. Because for me, this year was really kind of pushing this idea that, uh, of mimetic warfare to the next level. At least that's how I experienced it. And so that's what I want to talk about today. So first, uh, what is mimetic warfare? So mimetic warfare is a modern type of information warfare and psychological warfare involving the propagation of memes on social media through platform weaponization. That's from Wikipedia. And thereby memes are replicating information patterns, ways to do things, learned elements of culture, beliefs, or ideas. And it's even recognized by the NATO now. So mimetic warfare is competition over narratives, ideas, and social control in a social media battlefield. One might think of it as a subset of information operations tailored to social media. Information operations involve the collection and dissemination of information to establish a competitive advantage over an opponent. And yeah, that's basically what a lot of people are doing these days, uh, especially the Bitcoin maxis like Max over there. Um, so the way I look at it is um, mimetic warfare is basically three things. You know, we have, we have memes, that's the you know, information patterns, and we have different tribes that are using these memes to win an information war on the battlefield. And the tribes, it can be you know, state actors, it can be non-state actors like corporations, and it can also be different interest groups that spontaneously form, you know, cryptocurrency proponents and different ideologies. And uh, what I found also interesting there is that the battlefield, I mean, it's all these different platforms, and they're not neutral, of course. I mean, the, the, the platforms themselves, they have their own interests, and they try to, to shape the, uh, the warfare going on there. Um, and so, ultimately, the goal, I think, of mimetic warfare is about that you want to get to, do peop get to uh, people to do something, or get people not to do something that they would otherwise do or not do. So, because otherwise, why, why are you engaging in it? And, um, and to, to reach that goal, it uses uh, viral disinformation, usually trying to cloud rational judgment. And um, so, why is everybody engaged in it? I mean, at least that's how it seems to me that a lot of people are engaged in mimetic warfare. And although the game is rigged, the battlefield is neutral. You're competing with professionals. Um, I mean, for example, the Russian troll army, their entire states, they have huge departments of people doing this. 
and it clouds judgment, which means it reduces the likelihood of correct conclusions. And um, why are people doing it then? And I think that's basically because it feels good, you know? Um, memes are the information equivalent of fast food. They make you feel good, but lack substance. Um, and tribes also feel good. The old uh, us versus them game is always, you know, a very uh, popular one. And I think with mimetic warfare, it's, it's very, um, it's a very good mechanism to, you know, become part of a tribe and fight against the other guys. And uh, social media is just basically only about feelings anyway. You know, I mean, the whole, the whole reason of social media or the whole goal of social media is to maximize your engagement. And that's usually by evoking emotions, which can be good emotions or bad emotions. And um, so why do these memes feel good? Uh, I think they often give you the impression that you don't have to change. And that's always good, because changing sucks and it's work, and so if you don't have to change, that's great. And it's also often, it gives you the impression that there's a simple solution, um, which is also great, or that it's, uh, things just solve itself automatically. And uh, often there's also some solution like, okay, everybody has to change, except me, of course. And then if, if they do that, then the problem is solved. Um, for example, libertarians, I am uh, used to identify as one. There's often this idea, you know, we just convince everybody, you know, to understand the philosophy and then the world will change. And that also means the others have to change. I don't have to do anything. Um, oops. There's some lag there, sorry. Uh, yeah, so it's always good if I don't have to change and things will resolve itself or by the others changing. And so mimetic warfare basically is a very easy way to make the world a better place by one tweet at a time. Um, and what I want to talk about now is basically uh, some older memes, or at least what I received as memes, um, and then some newer one. And older ones, they mean uh, that means um, yeah, maybe five years, ten years old. So uh, one one famous one was always okay. The internet will route around censorship. So that uh, was used a lot when when you know when I was talking about privacy and you know concerns about censorship. People would say, okay, but the internet it just routes around censorship. So um, that means we don't have a problem. And um, that's, first of all, it's factually false. You know, the internet is not like this distributed thing. It has actually concrete, you know, it has like physical cables and it's not a, like a mesh net. It has these big physical cables and that's where you can censor easily. And also it means that, um, that the whole, you know, censorship censor problem often moves to a different layer. You know, what we can see with social media is that, uh, it's not censorship on the on the uh, TCP/IP layer. It's censorship on the platform layer that is actually the problem. So, um, and that's you know one meme where you can see it's it's this thing like oh yeah we don't have a problem. It solves itself. It will just route around and uh, and then there's nothing we have to do. And the next one was uh, just use Tor, uh, which is even worse than the previous one. And it was always like, okay, I have a privacy problem. I need to anonymize something. Just use Tor. You know, that solves the problem. And um, first of all, if you try to use Tor today, if you're not accessing hidden services, but if you try to actually anonymize yourself on the internet, it's basically impossible. So, I mean, I don't know if you tried recently, but if you do, you, you use any website, you basically become a bot filling out captures. That's what you do all day. And if you try to register an email address, uh, let's say with Proton Mail, they don't want just a capture, they want a phone number or a ma email. And then if you use this email service, they don't accept you if you're using Tor, um, the secondary email service. So um, it, it was not just factually false, but the, the even worse thing was that it, um, it kind of hindered research into anonymization technologies for probably, I would say, 10 years. 
you know, I was always saying that mixed networks are much more uh, capable of delivering true anonymity, but this meme that you can just use Tor to solve the problem actually kind of, at least that's my impression, hindered research into uh, mixed networks. Luckily now some people um, started that up again, but um, yeah, for me it showed how, how dangerous these, these memes can be. Um, oh, that's another favorite. Uh, Given enough eyeballs, all bugs are, sh bugs are shallow. That was also like when the you know, open source movement started. It's like somehow we don't have to take care of quality anymore because you know, when enough people look at it, then there are no bugs because they are, uh, they're automatically found. And then over the years, you could see you know, these days people find um, bugs that are 10, 20, 30 years old in some ancient code bases and nobody somehow found them before, although everybody was looking at them. And uh, there are other techniques which are now coming up like uh, fuzzing and things like that, who actually find a lot of bugs that, that have been und uh, undetected before. And uh, yeah, like I said, there was another, another meme that kind of hindered research because it told us, oh yeah, we don't have to, we don't have to do anything. Um, it solves itself, itself automatically. And um, if, I, if I look at it and try to categorize into some you know, common fallacies, it's like often there is only one solution. Um, it's, it's something that is, that is pushed, you know, like, like I said what is, uh, with Tor, it's like, okay, this is the solution, use it. It's in the cryptocurrency space the same. It's always like, oh yeah, this is one solution. You use it and then we solve the problem. And it also has often this implied thing of we have to take over the world with, with our preferred solution, which is an ideal solution. And the big, uh, a big fallacy I find in this space is that it's uh, often assumed that the opponent is static. So we somehow have this you know, battlefield where we... Um, we try to improve a problem, and it is implicitly assumed in, in, uh, in the thinking that the oppo opponent will not react. You know, let's say, with cryptocurrencies, you know, everybody's using cryptocurrencies, the state will crumble. Well, they might react, you know, and if you do not put that into your thinking before, then um, you're basically giving them a huge advantage. Um, and for, from what I've seen recently, this, you know, warfare has really um, uh, took up speed. Uh, it it's became more and more. And uh, I think one of the driving factors is uh, authority bias. It's, it's often, you know, when we, when we see authorities doing something, um, yeah, it, it gives this impression that, that it's actually correct and also popularity bias. And social media really, um, you know, push that forward. And in social media, these two kind of come together because how you're an authority these days, you become an authority by popularity vote. So you have whatever, 20,000 followers on Twitter, and boom, you're an authority. And like I said, social media really pushes that and also um, kind of creates this information overload situation where we, um, where we get so much information that we cannot really uh, process it anymore. And um, therefore, we kind of fall into these uh, simplistic thinking patterns. And we, sometimes we just look at our own group because then we don't have to deal with all the other information. So, you know, creating this tribalization, and which is both a cause and effect. I mean, it's. Tribalization kind of causes this mimetic uh, warfare, but also the mimetic warfare and all these, you know, memes and all the information overload has the effect that it's it's easier if you just, you know, focus on our own our own group, and it it helps you to reduce complexity. You don't have to you don't have to deal with all the problems, and you just focus on your group, you know, th your, the favorite memes, and it's also a great way of you know virtue signaling. Um, because you can show, okay, yeah, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm for cryptocurrency A, or I'm for this course, and then, you know, your tribe cheers you on, and um, but it doesn't really help you to find the actual truth. And um, 
So I want to be, uh, I want to look at some newer memes and uh, just give you my, my opinion on it. Uh, might be a little bit controversial. Um, yeah, which, which just like, like the earlier one, it kind of pisses me off, honestly, that it's always repeated. And usually it has this, you know, panacea flair to it. Okay, we just have to decentralize everything. If we decentralize everything, we don't have a problem. And um, so first of all, there is a difference between distribution and decentralization. So, um, and often it it's gets confused. So if, we, if we're talking about decentralization, what we're actually talking about often is distribution. For example, Bitcoin and most other cryptocurrencies, they're not decentralized, they're just distributed. There's only one consensus, there's only one system. So it's not that we have multiple systems, it's like multiple different rules competing with each other, it's just like one rule set, and that is dis decentralized over many computers. And uh, we don't really solve problems magically by de decentralizing them. I mean, it's, it's a good approach in many cases, but it doesn't solve everything. Um, another one is it just has to be transparent. And I uh, find that a lot with um, complaints about the state, that, yeah, the state is, you know, intransparent in some areas. If we just have to make it transparent, then we don't have uh, so many problems. But uh, one of the big uh, problems I see with transparency is that um, just because something is transparent doesn't mean you can act on the information. So, because um, acting on information actually has a huge cost associated with it. You have to, you know, analyze the information, you need the processing capability to analyze it, and then you need the ability to act on it. I think uh, we can see that with a lot of these um, leaks, you know, like Panama Papers and things like that. There's a lot of information which basically, which suddenly becomes public, and then it doesn't really change anything because nobody can really act on it, and it's a, it's a huge uh, treasure trove of information that um, has to be um, acted on. Um, it's the same with uh, public, um, what's it called, um, public offers. You know, when the state says, okay, we want to build something, then uh, we make it all transparent, the whole process. But you, as a small company, you cannot really act on this. You know, you have to be a large corporation that is able to fill all the papers, you know, do all this huge transparent process, and then somehow you, you make money in the end, and it was all very transparent, but it doesn't mean that uh, small entities actually had a chance. Um, yeah, Bitcoin fixes this. Um, you know, the, for me, that's, it's oversimplistic. First of all, Bitcoin is, is a technology, you know, it's like, okay, you have a problem, you want to do payments or you want to save money and then you have a technology which helps you to do that. But I don't really see the connection between Bitcoin and here we have no state. You know, that, that's how it's often, you know, shown. It's like, okay, boom, Bitcoin fixes this and then we, have, we, we don't have a problem anymore. Which, like I said, it often ignores that the opponent isn't static. You know, if you're trying to take on the fiat money system, they're not going to be just sitting there, do nothing. You know, it's like what we heard in the, in the panel discussion, the uh, increase in KYC and AML. You know, that, that was already obvious eight years ago that it's going to happen, because the more successful you become, the, uh, the bigger the, the force of the opponent will be, to change the situation. And um, it's a big fallacy to think that, you know, the state is not capable of doing these things. It's often just very slow and it doesn't have to, you know, react to any small threat. Um, so, which doesn't mean, you know, I'm, I don't think Bitcoin is great, but it's, like I said, oversimplistic to say, think, okay, it automatically solves the problem. And, it also doesn't automatically solve all the problems. 
we, we still have a lot of other problems. And um, yeah, corollary to Bitcoin fixes this is smart contracts will solve this. Um, so that somehow is this idea we have this you know complicated um, legal system, human interactions, court cases, or private mediation, and we somehow we can distill all of this into software that then decides automatically. And I think that's, that's actually not just wrong, it's dangerous. Because um, what that means is that you can predict the future. You know? it's, I mean, I'm not talking about something like you, know, you do a market maker smart contract. I'm talking about complicated problems. And what you're doing there is you, you're basically saying, yeah, I can predict the future, even if you're able to you know, write this all correctly, which is hard enough with solidity. You know, it's, even if you can do that and you, you can prove that your code works correctly, it means that you can predict the future for humans and then you know, every possibility you decide in advance. And I think that's some, some hubris involved, you know? And actually, do we really want that? Do we really want, you know, like a program decide over humans in the future automatically and not be able to, you know, change anything uh, anymore? Um, and the next one then is basically that with a decentralized autonomous organization, we don't have the problem. Um, don't get me wrong, I, I see, think there's a lot of um, potential in improving organizations with different models, you know, moving away from just like, okay, VC funded startups, you know, where basically you have the VCs, you have the, the founders and they have the employees and, you know, to create um, more flexible organizations. I think that's great, but similarly, we, it doesn't solve all the problems automatically. Um, because the, the basic human drive that we have, uh, you know, that some people you know, want to grab a bigger, pay, a bigger piece of the pie and, and things like that, they will still exist. And um, so there as well, I think um, it yeah, doesn't automatically solve it. And um, actually prevents us from finding good solutions if we oversimplify it. Um, okay, yeah. And some, some fallacies I saw over the years. Uh, actually, this one I, I fell into uh, many times. I, I call it the uh, loophole fallacy. So, um, especially libertarians, um, often the thinking is, okay, I have to find the loophole, you know, the tax law X that saves me money, or passport Y from country Z, and I don't have a problem anymore. And um, I think the big problem with this uh, approach is that it actually implies something about the state that the state doesn't fulfill, namely that it acts according to its own laws, and it doesn't. And also, again, it's not static. So. Um, just because there is a loophole, if you actually exploit the loophole, there won't be the loophole anymore in the future. And I think that's, you know, wastes a lot of energy often. And um, corollary is the technology will fix it. Again, it's like, okay, somehow automatically technology will solve the problem. And um, I think it kind of ignores that technology is neutral and there are different groups who uh, you know, can, you can push for privacy and you can push for a surveillance state. And um, it really depends what we build. It doesn't automatically solve, solve the problem. Similar to the market will fix it. You know, there is no market. It's, if, if there's nobody doing anything, then the market doesn't matter. So it's, in the end, it's about people acting on the market. That what will solve the problem or not solve the problem. The market itself doesn't really care. Um, yeah, this year, a uh, big one for me, really surprised me. Libertarian COVID-19 reasoning uh, was, okay, state interventions are bad. The state and ex COVID-19 measures. Conclusion, there's no virus. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I 
It's true. Or? <laughs> yeah, you, you have to walk to me through this, uh, this reasoning later then. Um, I really don't get it. Um, okay, so what does it mean for society and one's personal life? Um, I think we, we kind of, like with 2020, cyberpunk age, uh, we reached the uh, future shock state uh, described in uh, 1970, too much change in too short of a period of time. And uh, yeah, it's my impression that we really, um, we arrived there, you know, especially with some events happening, a lot of things changing that we're basically overwhelmed with too much information these days. And um, which I think is one of the reasons why uh, opinions are so fragmented, you know, it's so, everything is so polarized. And uh, yeah, we, I think often we don't really understand the, the present anymore. And uh, so I was wondering, okay, how do we stay sane in an insane world? Um, it's just my, my personal opinion. But uh, I think it's important to try to detribalize and search for real diversity of opinion. And I highlighted opinion because I think there's a lot of talk about diversity. And it's diversity talk is usually about very superficial things. You know, it's like, okay, you have to, you need 50% men and women, you need different skin colors. But what we actually need, I think, is you need diversity of opinion. And that's the hard thing to find. You, you know, look for, um, to actually, you know, deliberately search for opinions that conflict with your own ones. And, um, and for that, what also is really helpful, I think, is disconnecting. I said it in the beginning, for me, that was a really good experience to just, you know, detach for a month and be able to um, yeah, not take in all the, the information immediately. And um, because that, that's, that's part of the problem with the information overload we have, it's not just the amount of information, but also the speed. And sometimes I think we need to do some, some fasting. And, uh, you know, when memes put your brain in a box, perspective gets it out. And detribalization and also fasting gets you, gets you out of it. Um, yeah, embrace uncertainty. Um, to go back to the, to the COVID thing, I think that's also some... some um, some trend today is that, that everybody wants to ha be certain immediately. And especially when we don't, when we cannot be certain, you, you cannot really reach a, co uh, in a correct conclusion. So and it's, I think it's really important to sometimes say, okay, I really don't know. And maybe nobody knows at this point. And embrace that and you know, have this humility and say, okay, I, I really don't know. And, um, because when, you, when you're still in that stage of uncertainty, you can, you can actually consider different options. And um, yeah, finally, that you know, reminding ourselves that the actions are a matter and that we, that we don't really change the world by you know, posting memes all the time, but actually the most important things are our actions. And, um, and you know, when, you, when you look at the, the uh, information landscape, then I think it's, it's helpful to ask these questions. Um, who does it serve if I do this or if I don't do this? Um, because usually or very often it's somebody else's agenda. How might the opponent react if this approach is successful? You know, it goes back to this concept of order loops again, you know, that the opponent isn't static and if we want to win something, we have to consider their reaction bef before we, we do it. And um, yeah, who might have opposing views and why? Just you know, detribalization again, trying to find different viewpoints and, and not thinking that they're stupid. Uh, it's usually the other group is not stupid. Um, what if nobody knows? Embrace uncertainty. And how can I test this myself? Preferably in meat space. Um, yeah, and I want to close with one of my favorite quotes that the point of view is worth 80 IQ points. Um, which makes you super smart. Uh, yeah, so that's basically it. Um, thank you very much for listening.
Thanks, Smuggler, for discuss discussions about this. Yeah, somebody mentioned it. We, we ramble a, a lot longer than this uh, on the podcast. You can contact me here, download the slides, and yeah, I'm very happy to answer some questions. And thanks for listening again. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Frank. That was a great uh, presentation. Um, I, I would love to uh, get to audience questions, but just to warm you up and, and get uh, one of you. Um, you know, having a tribe is useful sometimes uh, because to have peers uh, to fight for that have similar principles, that have similar opinions and share that uh, is, is a nice curation of whom to collaborate with. But at, at what point does the tribalism actually go negative uh, and, and become uh, not, no longer useful and actually go into warfare? Well, I think when you, uh, first of all, I totally agree with you, it's very useful and it's, it's not just useful, it's also very um, yeah, it's a good thing, you know, it's like a f having a family. Uh, it's, it's a great thing to have peers. I think it becomes problematic at the point where you're completely closed off to outside information, to, to new points of view, when it becomes, yeah, totally dogmatic. I think that's, that's the point where it changes. So, uh, first of all, I consider myself a libertarian and just because the government is taking like over away our freedoms and stuff doesn't mean that I don't believe there is a virus. So I think you're assuming that all libertarians think that there isn't the virus doesn't exist, but I don't know anyone that is a libertarian that says so. And then you said that you should not assume that someone that thinks different than you is stupid, but I think you just did that. No, I was I was implying that for all libertarians. I'm, I consider myself a libertarian, so um, it was just my impression what I, what I had at, at some online things that I I I, I, f I saw a lot of knee-jerk reactions, which basically were like, okay, the state does something, and we hate the state, and therefore it's always bad. That was my impression. Uh, I, I would like to ask if you think there is any connection between the concept of internet meme and the concept of evolutionary meme. Uh, do you think that internet memes have mind of their own and they uh, want to spread themselves and ensure their survival? Thank you. Um, I think there is a connection. Yeah, I think uh, it, it's a useful. Um, it is. It's a useful, at least it's a useful abstraction to, to view genes and memes as similar and that they kind of develop a, a mind of their own. Can I ask the question, uh, answer the question actually? So uh, biological viruses and informational ones, which are memes, both of them have a life cycle. Uh, the definition of a meme is an informational virus. Anyhow, uh, both things have life cycles, which can be pretty much the same. For example, an, uh, informational viruses, which are memes, they even can, can mutate, uh, for example, because of the, some, because of some something breaks in the transmission path or because something gets broken while decoding or encoding the information. And of course, um, a lot of things can be changed because of the host, because of the mental storage that the host has, which is basically, if you tweak the sentences a bit, are still about biological viruses. Um, my question would be, how can you get the immunity against informational viruses because as far if you if we take, talk about biology then you still need to get a huge capacity of your brain to be able to encode and decode a lot of information to be able to pass it and especially to pass it to your allies to someone that should have the same information the key <laughs> to unlock the information but that should be pretty complex otherwise we get just parasitic memes that we can see all over the place these days, and they do more harm than gain immunity. 
Well, I, I think to, to gain immunity, uh, th that's where the, um, the analogy breaks down. I mean, like a virus is, you know, some virus enters your, your body and, you know, interacts with your immune system. You don't really, it's an automatic reaction. You don't really have any volition in the process. But with, with memes, with information, you actually, you have free will. You know, you can actually look at the information yourself and assess it. And um, there you can actually choose. And l like I said, for me, one of the biggest things is to, um, I mean, to gain immunity are the things I mentioned in the presentation. You know, you try to, you put space between, you know, input and output. You, tr you look for different opinions. You try to embrace uncertainty. Of course, you talk to other people and, um, that's how you can, well, gain immunity. I don't know if you actually need to have immunity against ideas. You know, I, I think. Sorry, sorry. Can I uh, try to answer that? Uh, like uh, Paul Paul Rosenberg. Sorry, sorry. Paul, can Paul we, Rosenberg. Sorry. Can we stay to the questions and have the, you know, discussion? Yeah, about about uh, meme immunity. So how do you gain immunity? I think Paul Rosenberg has on answered that quite brilliantly in his book, God Wants You Dead, which is all about memes and uh, meme complexes and how they evolve. Uh, so the way to have immunity is to question everything. You need to, to question each, uh, each part of a meme or a meme complex. Like any ideology is a meme complex, any religion is a meme complex. It's made up of several different ideas. And some ideas are good and beneficial for your own individual survival, some, some are not. So never buy the whole package. You need to question everything individually. Uh, so that's, that's part of it. And uh, I highly recommend uh, reading Paul Rosenberg's book, uh, God Wants You Dead. Hi. Um, first of all, I just want to say <clears throat> thanks for a great presentation. Uh, I couldn't read any of the slides. So I hope you change the color scheme the next time. Um, I said Thank yeah for no virus. What I was meaning specifically was um, I think this is a bad case of the flu. I hope we don't get it. I hope you don't get it. We don't get it. But to shut down the world economy, put all these people on the dole, unemployed and sort of limited freedoms in the future, for one million deaths out of nearly eight billion people, I think is a massive overreaction. For me, it's clearly the beginning of the, gro the Great Reset. So I guess this is nothing new for you guys in here, but the world outside, they, um, yeah, I think it's not going to be great for quite a while. That was a statement. <laughs> well, it would be nice to get one more question in. Thanks. Um, how uh, do I question everything without going nuts? <laughs> and and if I if I may add just one one thing, um, I, I think I forgot it now. Um, um, oh yeah, the, um, <clears throat> I think the key about Corona is not if the virus exists or not, but um, what is the effect of the false positive ratios, uh, percentage of tests? I think it's one critical issue. Thank you. Well, I don't know how, how you don't get nuts. You know, it's... Um, give yourself some space. Sabbaticals, yeah. Karen time. <laughs> it was a joke. <laughs> so, um, in order to, you need to have something against what you would verify the incoming information. And that something should be your inner system of values, which would be the most robust thing that you ever have in your life. Because if you use 
uh, the information and if you verify the incoming information against, again, some outer system, you will be always confused because you will not get, you will not even understand and comprehend part of this information and you will not understand how the verification system works. If you build that verification system within, within yourself, using knowledge, tools, experience, and blah, 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 and meditation and sabbaticals, you have chances to still stay, stay sane a bit. There was a question in the back there. Uh, I'm sorry that I'm taking part in the discussion now. Don't forget that ideas are not, and even our biological immune system has nothing to do with um, individuals. It has to do with groups, and groups verify, and groups build immunity. Even your body is a group of systems and parts that react. And for your reaction to a virus, for example, a lot of that has to die to actually find out how to defend yourself against that. So I would suggest, if I may, look at the people that run around with certain memes look at their emotional stability, psychological stability, whatever, and that alone gives you a good indicator of how healthy they are and if you should follow that meme. That sounds like solid advice, Mungo. Any final questions? Uh, I feel like the meme culture and people fighting on the internet has a lot to do with like being unhappy and being frustrated in your life. Because I think if you're a happy and okay person, you not like spend hours of your day like fighting random people on the internet. So I think we should be taking care more like of our health and like mental health and like I think that would solve everything. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. Um, absolutely. I took a lot of walks this year, and that really helped my mental state. I have to say, there was a period where I didn't read anything. You know, uh, unfortunately, I got sick then because I did the walks. But that's a different story. But absolutely, yeah, it's 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 a mental health thing, and uh, sitting in front of a keyboard. Fighting with strangers on the internet usually doesn't help. Yeah. <laughs>